Welcome back to day three of the 2021 AMS Washington Forum. Next up is session six entitled Energy Policy and Science in the Next Decade. I'm delighted to introduce to the stage as moderator John Zach, who has been so instrumental along with his partners, uh, Jeffrey Friedman and Eric Wartz in setting up a delightful uh, panel for us with great uh, speakers. So really excited and I hope you enjoyed as well. John, over to you. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome to uh, session six of the AMS Washington Forum, which has the hopefully intriguing title, Energy Policy and Science in the Next Decade. I am John Zach from Mesel Incorporated, and I have been active as a renewable energy consultant for the past 25 years, and I am also a co-chair of the AMS Renewable Energy Committee. I will serve as the moderator for this session and will be assisted by Jeff Friedman, who is a research scientist at the uh, Atmospheric Science Research Center of the University at Albany, Thomas State University of New York. Jeff is the other co-chair of the AMS Renewable Energy Committee. And for the purposes of this session, he will have the much sought after title of deputy moderator. So as many of you know, we are in the early stages of a historic transformation of our electric systems from ones that are mostly driven by fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas to systems that may ultimately be based almost exclusively on renewable resources such as hydro, wind, and solar. If this transformation proceeds as it's widely envisioned, the sensitivity of the resulting generation and distribution systems to weather and climate variations may be much greater than it is with the current system. Consequently, at this time, the electric energy enterprise has a unique opportunity to use meteorological knowledge and information to develop electric systems that can effectively manage the generation and demand variability associated with weather changes at the lowest possible cost, while also maintaining or increasing uh, user expected high levels of reliability. So the theme of this session will be, how can we more effectively use meteorological knowledge and information in the policymaking, design, and operation of future electric systems? And we are for very fortunate to have four panelists who have extensive expertise and experience in the interaction of meteorological knowledge and information with the renewable energy enterprise from four different perspectives, historical, research, operational, and policymaking. So each panelist will make a 10 minute presentation to be followed by a 30 minute discussion and Q&A period. So please submit your questions for the discussion period through the chat function. And you, you may do so during the presentations or uh, uh, during the discussion period, but please also remember to note your organizational affiliation. So our first speaker will be Justin Sharp from Sharply Focused uh, LLC. Justin is currently a renewable energy consultant, and from his personal experience, he has a broad perspective on the history and issues in the deployment and operation of renewable energy resources over the past two decades. He will provide an historical overview of the ways in which meteorological information has been used and the associated issues. Our second presenter will be Julie Lundquist. Julie is an associate professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. And is also a fellow at the university's Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute. Julie has been engaged in the investigation of the impact of atmospheric processes on renewable generators, as well as the impact of renewable generators on atmospheric processes for many years. And Julie will provide thoughts from a research perspective. Following Julie, we will have a joint presentation from an operational electric system perspective. The speakers will be Adam Sapowski and Stephen Rose of the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, also known as MISO, which is one of the largest electric system and market operators in North America. Adam is a meteorologist and a senior analyst at MISO, and Stephen is an R&D advisor and has a background in energy policy. 
Now, our final speaker will be Mark Holstrom. Mark is Vice President of Renewable Energy Policy at NextEra Energy Resources and NextEra Analytics Incorporated, and is also the President of the Energy Systems Integration Group. Mark has been a thought leader in the renewable energy community for more than two decades. As his next era title implies, Mark will provide thoughts from the policy perspective. So now we'll get started and we'll go over to Justin for a historical perspective. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. This is a really, really um, important topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm going to basically try and tee up everybody else by telling you how meteorology is currently being used um, within the energy sector and where we need to go um, as we go through this energy transition. Next slide, please. So basically today, we already have a weather dependent system before we add renewables in. Um, our demand or load as we call it in the business is driven by temperature and also modified by humidity and wind. Um, a distribution system that gets the power from um, the city gates to your houses uh, is affected by wind, snow and ice, as I'm sure everybody knows. The trans transmission system is also um, affected by those types of weather. Um, it's also impacted by temperature and uh, increasingly recently has been heavily impacted by uh, wildfire. Um, and generation is also impacted by temperature. The ranking cycle um, is temperature dependent and extreme temperature events can also create outages uh, from cold events and also warm events can create outages due to uh, cooling water um, uh, constraints. Next slide, please. So in the energy transition, we're moving from, as John said, fossil fuels being the primary fuels to the weather being the primary fuel. And I have a personally long held opinion that shoehorning renewables into the existing system as it stands today um, simply won't work. We need radical change. Um, and uh, I've got a quote here, which is uh, said with a fair amount of irony. If you've always done it that way, it's probably wrong. Um, Charles Kettering um, was uh, uh, inventor of the, uh, was, was one, of, one of the people involved in the invention of the uh, internal combustion engine. Um, and also uh, some things associated with Freon. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting, ironic quote. Um, next slide, please. So um, here are some of the ways that things are going to change um, from a meteorological perspective in the energy transition. The load will become more weather modulated um, due to electrification of heat and also transit. One of the things that's been missed um, in a lot of the discussions is that electric vehicles will tend to be getting preconditioned uh, right at the time when our morning peaks happen for loads right now. And we need to get our arms around that, but also we're getting plugged in right around the morning peak if people take them to work and we go down, we don't sort of think about how we manage the recharging when people get to work. Um, the same variables will exist for transmission and distribution, but there's much more complexity now because we have um, uh, less delineation between what's generation and what's load with people having solar on their roofs, etc. Generation and storage will become heavily defined by the weather. Um, the maximum output of a renewable power plant is, of course, defined by the weather. And so not only do you now have a weather modulated system, you have a, a system where the generation essentially becomes defined by the weather. Um, and I won't go through all the details there. Those are there for, uh, for folks who uh, want to look in more detail. Um, but on top of all that, throw in climate change. Uh, you've got changes to wildfire distribution, which affect transmission distribution, smoke impacts on solar, and all parts of the system that become more weather dependent, obviously are now more impacted by the potential effects of uh, climate change. But I do want to note that the natural variability that we already see today is the thing that I feel we need to get our arms around um, first. The climate change stuff is important, but we have some big challenges on its own before we start thinking about climate change. Next slide, please. So here I'm going to try and sort of show you how we currently use meteorology in the electric system and then at the same time show you 
uh, how it's incredibly siloed right now and how much opportunity there is. So I'm going to start with mid to long term planning at the utility and the system operator level. Um, basically, the question is, is what is the future demand going to be? How much how much um, energy are people going to use? What's the extreme peak and what's the average by season? And um, also, uh, how do we expand our generation and uh, uh, and deal with scheduled outage planning? Uh, what should be um, what should be out and when. And right now we use meteorology to look at uh, temperature and load observations and use simple models to extrapolate time series of what we think the load's going to be in the future. And we also have some stochastic models which can basically look at um, how we would expand our generation into the future. But they, they're using um, typical meteorological years and often use non-coincident um, data sets for wind and solar and temperature and parameterizations like the effective load carrying capacity for uh, wind and solar, which are just not the right way to do it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that probably in the discussion session. Uh, next, please. So then we also have transmission planning, which is largely the meteorological impact of that is largely limited at the moment to infrastructure engineering line capacity and ex by expected and line capacity by expected use time. So that depends on temperature and things like extreme winds. We're using climate data, engineering models and stochastics for that. It's very simple. Next slide, please. So that intersects with the um, with the, the planning for utility operations uh, from a generation and a load perspective. The, the, um, um, what I've tried to do here is the amount of um, meteorological knowledge that we currently have is sort of shown by um, how transparent these bubbles are. Next slide, please. So then we've got renewable energy development. We actually are using meteorology a lot for this. Um, meteorology defines where we put our renewables, uh, what renewables we build, how much energy they will produce, when they produce it, what is the variability and uncertainty, um, what is the suitability of the site from the perspective of severe weather, inflow angles of wind, things like that, other engineering concerns. And we're using some pretty sophisticated methods using numerical weather prediction, um, CFD, um, and uh, also a lot of observations. And there have been huge improvements in this area in the last 15 years. But if you go to the next slide, please, you will see that they barely intersect with those first two bubbles. Next one, please. So then looking at operations now, um, how much demand is expected and when? This is now looking at sort of the next week to the next day, to the next hour. So minutes minutes to, to weeks, basically. And we're using observations, numerical weather prediction um, as inputs to load models, which are typically artificial neural networks or uh, machine learning systems uh, to produce uh, net load forecasts. And often those will have a meteorologist um, involved in that loop as well. And in the generation side of things, um, for market operations, uh, unit commitment, which means what units am I going to use to provide the power that I expect to meet load with, and for dispatch, when, where, and what. Uh, we're using renewable energy generation forecasts and weather forecasts. Uh, weather forecasts are used for the infrastructure risk. Um, you know, when we have an extreme cold wave that can affect the generation. And then also there's some in-house meteorology. Those two items in themselves are somewhat siloed. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see how siloed that is. It barely touches anything right now. Um, next slide, please. So uh, renewable project operations um, is the short term minutes to months of how much, when, and uncertainty. And this is, uh, this is used for uh, maintenance planning, trading, and scheduling by those those entities that actually run the generators. Um, and they're looking at uh, renewable generation forecasts and climate signals um, for seasonal time scales. Uh, next one, please. And you'll see that that does intersect reasonably well 
with some of the utility system operations and the renewable generation development, but only at a level of about 15 to 20%. We really need to get way more holistic with this. Next one, please. And then lastly, I want to talk about transmission operations, which is largely infrastructure risk, um, risks from wind, fire, lightning, snow and ice. And then also there's uh, increasingly the ability to uh, use weather to um, see what the dynamic loading of lines is. And um, that is using numerical weather prediction and in-house modeling as well. Next one, please. And you can see that that intersects pretty strongly actually with the utility system operations. So now we have this big picture of the intersections and you can see there are a lot of silos and not a lot of intersection. Next one, please. Oh, the last two things that I wanted to mention is R&D is actually pretty sophisticated and is uh, intersecting all of these sections. And we can actually see from projects like uh, the NREL study uh, called SEAMS and the NARIS study from NREL and a project I've recently been involved in that looks at tail events for renewables, that with sophisticated meteorology, we really can show how the system will work in the future. Next one, please. But unfortunately, policy is not being informed by this type of thing. It's been informed by weather events like the ones that recently happened uh, this winter time and the ones that happened in the summer last year. Um, and uh, there's very little sophistication in policy uh, with respect to renewables. For example, the production tax credit incents people to put renewables where they generate the most power. That might at first glance seem like it's the most sensible thing to do. But if all that power is generated at night, is it really as valuable as power that matches our load? Next one, please. So what I'd like to see is, is getting out of these silos and as quickly as possible, uh, if we're going to take the electric system to 80% uh, renewables by 2030, which is the new Biden um, um, proposal, uh, we're going to have to employ some serious meteorology. Next one, please. And so this slide is called, it's the meteorology stupid. I've had this slide for several years. Some folks might have seen it before. And it shows um, the three key areas, which is operations and markets, transmission planning and resource adequacy uh, or capacity value determination and where meteorology touches. So if we uh, advance uh, one at a time, next one, please. There are correlations between wind, solar, load, and hydro. These are not independent. Currently, they're largely treated as independent in the system. Next one. There are extreme events there are in, uh, that have impacts uh, and scale. We, we need to understand the impacts, the scale, the longevity, and the connections between these extreme events. There are common modes of failure. For example, we just saw uh, an extreme cold wave, which um, caused failures in gas, it caused failures in nuclear, and it caused failures in wind. Next one, please. Forecastability is not even being considered right now when most projects are built. Next one. Um, uncertainty at climate scales and at weather scales. Um, we need to truly understand uh, what we're building and how we can meet load. Next one. And then we need to look at the variability by um, season, um, by uh, day, and ramping. Um, all of these things are defined by the meteorology. And right now, the methodologies that are used in resource planning, particularly that early phase, uh, are not being informed by meteorology. Next one. And then the resource diversity in time and space, same thing. You can deal with a lot of your variability if you have good resource diversity to be able to smooth that variability out. Again, not something that's happening. Um, typically, a plant is built um, on, its, uh, on its own merits versus the system merits. Next. And climate change. Next one, please. So, so I don't take other folks time. I'm going to quickly go through this one. So I've made an analogy that the geologist is to oil and gas as uh, the meteorologist is to the uh, new electric system. And you'll see that in the next uh, one. So we need to really look at all of these impacts and meteorology is absolutely crucial. It's not the be all and end all, but it is not being used enough. Next one. Next slide, please. Um, so here are my key takeaways. 
basically I want to make it really clear, and I hope I have, that meteorology touches every single part of the utility planning and operations, and it is becoming more important. We must get out of these silos and we must smooth the variability um, by considering at every step of the way the meteorology and operations uh, from in all, all um, steps from planning to operations, including our policy decisions. And I'm going to leave it at that so that I make sure I'm not eating up other people's time. Okay, thank you, Justin, for a, a great overview. And now we'll get a research perspective from uh, Julie Lovequist. Great, thanks very much, John, again. Uh, thank you for the invitation to contribute to this panel. And then Justin, thanks for giving a very good broad overview picture to help kind of lay the, the framework. So John had asked me to briefly highlight some successes in the R&D community to provide meteorological information to the energy community, and then to emphasize some areas where the flow of insights from research to operations perhaps needs some attention. So I thought it would be best to start with the tremendous effort that the atmospheric science community has put into developing forecast models. Next slide, please. So as we know, uh, we've developed forecast models uh, primarily to predict surface temperature and precipitation, and then perhaps to predict 500 millibar heights as we think about uh, the movements of weather systems. And so we have complicated equations that we put on grids and, and so on. But if we take wind energy as a specific example, uh, if you could click next, please then we can see that the needs of the wind energy community are different. So wind turbines integrate winds and turbulence between around 30 meters and 200 meters above the surface. Next, please. Whereas our forecast models are really focused on what's happening at the surface. And similar types of disconnects uh, happen in the solar energy community. But there's been a lot of effort from the R&D community to take the models that we use for weather prediction and tune them or add new parameterizations or add new capabilities to specifically use them for renewable energy purposes. Next, please. So one example of, of this effort is the development or modification of the weather research and forecasting model with special attention to parameterizations that are important for solar energy forecasting. So uh, there was a really nice article in BAMS several years ago discussing the numerous modifications that needed to be made to WARF specifically for, uh, for solar energy applications. And this figure that I have here on the right just shows some of the importance and some of the biases that were removed once these new parameterizations were implemented into WARF Solar. And I think it's particularly important to point out that a lot of these efforts have been focused on working on open source tools that are broadly useful to, to the much larger community. Next, please. So another example is um, other modifications to, to WARF specifically for wind energy applications. So again, we have an overview paper in BAMS highlighting how uh, significant field campaigns have then been turned into um, added value data products to improve numerical weather prediction models specifically for wind energy applications. Uh, Justin had mentioned the importance of being able to predict ramping events. Uh, that was one of the areas of focus of the WFIP2 field campaign. And then there will be another um, offshore focused WFIP3 campaign coming up. And again, these efforts are focused on improving modeling for the larger community and publicly distributing these, these research tools as well. Next, please. And then finally, it's important to recognize that um, there are smaller efforts happening at specific universities. So here's one example that I took from uh, Valerio Iango's work at UT Dallas, where his group is incorporating on-site LIDAR measurements with rapidly running models at particular wind plants in order to allow wind farm owner operators to understand the variability of their power production and how that varies with atmospheric conditions, how the wakes vary with atmospheric conditions and so on. Next, please. So now I'd like to shift gears to think about the fact that um, there is a lot of work happening in the research world where we're trying to understand the effects of renewables like wind and solar on regional climate, as well as downwind neighbors. Click next, please. So what we have here is a snapshot um, actually taken from Twitter of a wind farm that was captured on radar. And if you click next, please, there is an outflow boundary from a thunderstorm. And when we see the animation move through, we will see that the wind farm 
impacts the evolution of that outflow boundary. And you see that that outflow boundary tends to bend and deform. This is just one example of how um, wind farms are interacting or when plants are interacting with the larger atmosphere. So there, there's a two-way coupling there that's really important to think about. Now, for many years, we've recognized that there will be temperature impacts at night whereas wind turbines will mix air from above the inversion down to the surface. So we're moving air, warmer air from aloft down to the surface. And this has been noticed in both in situ and satellite observations. And then we can see that specific weather events like this thunderstorm are also impacted um, by wind farms. Next, please. Uh, let's just skip this next slide entirely, please. So go one more. Great. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to highlight is that we will generate wakes or regions of slow wind, downwind of a wind plant, but these wakes are important to understand in terms of power production, but it's also important to understand how the atmosphere affects wakes, because wakes are very consequential for the power production of a wind plant and eventually the bottom line of that wind plant, but the wakes are very predictable. We understand how those work. And so when we think to incorporate those into transmission planning, for example, it's possible to do that if we have accurate meteorological information. Next, please. Uh, it's really important to think about wakes as we develop offshore wind in the US. And so this map of the possible East Coast uh, development regions, we have both the existing lease areas, as well as some of the call areas that are potentially scheduled for future development. Those are all highlighted here. And this red arrow indicates uh, the dominant wind direction in summertime conditions when that renewably generated electricity will be most valuable. So we already know from our work in uh, onshore wind farms that the wakes will be most persistent in stably stratified conditions. And so that is going to be very consequential for this offshore situation. And so it's important for us to incorporate meteorological knowledge from the research world into our planning for transmission and the grid balancing. Next, please. So we've been um, at my research group, and um, in particular Dave Rosencrantz, a graduate student in my group, has been building offshore wind farms, as you can see here, um, in both the lease areas in orange and the call areas in white. And he has been um, building 10 megawatt turbines and then simulating the wakes that will be, um, will be generated from these individual wind farms. So this top right panel here shows the wakes from one particular wind farm in this large array in the Massachusetts and Rhode Island area. And then the bottom panel shows the wakes once we put all of those uh, wind plants into, um, into this uh, region. So you can see that there at certain times when the atmosphere is stably stratified, there will be very consequential wakes in terms of the wind speed deficit. But that is different from understanding the impacts on power production, as we'll see on the next slide. Well, here we have a time series of power production, and I'd want to draw your attention to the orange dashed line and the orange dotted line. So these are just time series, and the orange dashed line shows the production at one wind farm when that's the only wind farm in the region. And then the dotted line shows how uh, when we build out that region, we show the power production also for that same individual wind farm. And so you can see that at least for this particular time period, there are large amounts of time where the wakes, although they are large, are not consequential for power production because the wind speeds are so high that, um, that the power is already at maximum production anyway. And so I'd like to show this example to emphasize that we have to have a very nuanced understanding of atmospheric variability in order to understand wake impacts. So I really want to emphasize the importance of having good coupling between transmission and distribution planning and um, meteorological knowledge. Okay, next please. Yeah, so I just wanted to leave you with this last picture of um, what one of the examples of Dave's wakes looks like when we have um, a complete build out. And I want to emphasize that as we ramp up for the large scale deployment of renewables, it will be really important to have meteorological insights into wind plant wakes incorporated into the transmission and distribution policy and operations, as well as the overall design. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Julie, for a fascinating presentation. And we're gonna go over to the operational perspective now. And we have two representatives from the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, Adam Simkowski and Stephen Rose, and they will do a joint presentation. 
All right, I'm Stephen Rose and I'll get started with our presentation. So we occupy one of the silos that um, Justin Sharp talked about. We have occupy the day-to-day -day operations silo. So we're gonna talk about these day-to-day -day operations and how meteorology informs them. So let's go to the first slide. Um, I'm gonna assume a lot of you don't know what MISO is. Um, MISO is an independent, not-for-profit, unbiased third-party grid operator. Um, sometimes called a regional transmission organization, RTO, or independent system operator, ISO. They're subtle nuances, but I'm going to use them interchangeably. And when I talk about grid and grid operator, I'm talking about the high voltage transmission lines that, that move power from big power plants to cities, not the um, power plants that run, or the, the power lines that run down your street. Those are separate. They're owned and operated by someone else. Um, the goal of MISO is to ensure electricity is delivered reliably and at the lowest possible cost. Sometimes there's a trade-off between those. Um, MISO is like an air traffic controller on the power grid. So we manage the flow of power on the system to minimize congestion. And our markets set, select the most reliable and efficient generation resources. So we determine which power plants are needed at what time in order to supply the power at the lowest cost and maintain reliability. Um, so that means that the consumers receive the power that they want uh, from the generators that are most efficient to pr pr produce it. Um, and this is the value that we provide across our footprint, our service territory, which you can see on this map covers a lot of territory. It stretches from Manitoba in the north to Louisiana in the south, um, serves about 42 million people and a peak demand of about 127 gigawatts. Um, MISO is a member-driven organization. The members are utility companies and um, they, it's a voluntary organization. So utilities can choose to be a part of this market or some of the markets um, in neighboring territories. So let's go to the next slide where my colleague Adam Simkowski is gonna talk about how MISO uses meteorological information in its day-to-day -day operations. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to John, Jeff, and uh, the AMS for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to begin today touching on the current use and importance of meteorological data and grid operations. We covered this ground a little bit already, but hopefully I'll uh, be able to expand it on here in a little bit. So in operations, uh, as the slide title indicates, energy supply, which is generation, must match demand, which is load. So we do need to forecast both. Uh, and to illustrate this, the figure shown on the slide contains an hourly load forecast, an actual corresponding to the left-hand y-axis, along with a wind power generation forecast, an actual corresponding to the right-hand y-axis. The date chosen is of no significance other than wind generation was on the high side in MISO that day, and despite the forecast error displayed, reliable gr grid operations were maintained. Uh, solar isn't included on the graph because it's negligible in MISO currently, but I'll touch more on that here shortly. So at MISO, we rely on robust meteorological data to forecast both load and renewable energy. For load, we use six distinct weather variables in our load forecast models, including dry bulb, temperature, precipitation, and cloud cover, and other variables that correlate to power demand. The other sets of variables in our load forecast models are only calendar variables, such as hour of the day and day of the week. So meteorological variables really carry a lot of weight in load predictions and have a significant impact on accuracy. For renewables, fewer, fewer and different weather variables, as has been stated, are used, uh, and those include hub height, wind speed, uh, direction, and then temperature, and then uh, it's exclusively for wind. And then for solar, we use a radiance, temperature, and precipitation. Meteorological variables are almost exclusively uh, the variables used to forecast renewable generation, so they carry a tremendous amount of weight in the prediction accuracy. MISO receives meteorological data that are input into our load and renewable forecast models from multiple vendors, and the core of that data is typically a weighted accuracy average of multiple numerical weather prediction models. These, this process allows MISO to receive a single deterministic accurate forecast, among other forecast products as well. Through our vendors, we leverage the full suite of numerical weather prediction models from global models to higher resolution, smaller domain models as well. And at the current time, we're, we're working to integrate as well the, the models that were mentioned that are more specifically focused on forecasting renewables. That is, a, that is an ongoing effort. Their differences help improve the accuracy in our forecast over varying time ranges and location. And multiple numer numerical weather prediction models also allow MISO to utilize probabilistic forecasts for better planning. In addition to that, our forecasts are crucial to scheduling generators to effectively and uh, reliably meet the demand for electricity. Temperature forecasts a day or two ahead are quite accurate. They typically vary one to two degrees uh, from actual. 
and we depend on them quite heavily. So uh, most generators are scheduled a day ahead, but certain weather forecasts uh, can dictate otherwise. Forecasts that show extreme conditions several days in the future help our operators prepare in a few different ways, such as scheduling slow start generators early, an example of this being a coal plant that takes maybe 24 hours to start up, asking other generators to reschedule planned maintenance, and recommending generators to procure fuel in advance. If you could go to the next slide, please. So to quickly preface this slide, uh, as, as has been stated, you know, traditionally utilities and grid operators only needed to forecast load. Uh, but now uh, with, uh, with the growing penetration of renewables, the supply of energy is becoming more important to forecast uh, as well. And it is essential to schedule other generators around this variable supply to maintain grid reliability. Renewables will increase sharply in the next few years within MISO from our current levels of 26 gigawatts of wind and roughly 500 megawatts of solar. We're expecting 10 gigawatts of additional solar by the end of 2023, only a short two years away, with an additional four gigawatts of wind, which will place MISO at the 20% annual renewable penetration level shown in green on the figure. MISO expects to be at the 30% level by 2026, which is highlighted in orange. And the figures box and whisker plots show that the potential range of forecast error at each renewable milestone in MISO, at, in MISO. And this is a product of a study that MISO published recently called the Renewable Integration Impact Assessment Report. A little bit of a long name there, but its uh, acronym is RIA, and it is available on the MISO's website for you to review. The quick growth of renewables, while quite certainly exciting, uh, poses some challenges, and especially in the immediate upcoming years with great technology as it stands. We see on the figure that forecasting errors in terms of magnitude ex expand at each renewable growth benchmark. Traditional accuracy metrics like MAPE may maintain or even improve slightly, but forecasting errors will matter more because they will be larger and impact the uh, supply to a greater extent. And now to the next slide, please. So as supply and uncertainty variability grow, uh, this means that weather forecasting accuracy and situational awareness around risky, risky weather patterns, understanding which, which patterns matter most and when they occur both diurnally and seasonally will be crucial in the coming years. You'll notice that this figure looks similar to the previous slide. Now let Steve explain that further. So Steve, back to you. That's right. So the previous figure showed how uncertainty is going to, the forecast uncertainty is going to get bigger as we move into the future with more renewables. And this figure looks at how uh, variability will change. And there's a subtle distinction, but it's important here. Um, so this graph shows how much we can expect the, the, the system load to change in one hour. And moving to the right, you get higher and higher proportions of renewables. Um, and this is actually net load that we're graphing here. So this is the demand for electricity, minus the demand served by solar, minus the demand served by wind. So this is the demand for electricity that needs to be served by other resources, traditional power plants, things like that. Um, this, this shows that as we add more and more wind and solar, the, um, the variability and the need of other power plants to change their output faster will increase. You notice, however, that these don't increase as fast as the previous graph. So if, if we double the percentage of renewables, these, gra these bars don't get wider. And that's because sometimes um, the variations in wind and load uh, move in opposite directions and cancel each other out. It is also possible, and, and this is what Justin Sharp was talking about with the correlations between them, that they move in the same direction and make things worse. So. If, if, you, if these combined um, effects uh, require generators to change their power output faster, um, this is independent of how good our forecasting is. Um, as Justin Sharp, the first panelist, likes to say, you can't forecast your way out of variability, even if you can get the uncertainty to zero. You have to plan your way out of variability. And grid operators like us, need to evaluate whether the generators that we have today and the new generators that are gonna be built can adjust fast enough as the load and wind and solar change simultaneously. So let's go to the next slide. Um, when there's a large uncertainty or large variability, uh, neighboring ISOs, neighboring grid operators can help us out by exporting power if the weather conditions are different enough that they're not experiencing the same challenges. So we like to talk about geographic diversity, that the wind in um, Oklahoma is different than the wind in Michigan, 
And, and if we can move the power, then we can sort of smooth out that large scale variability and the forecast errors. Um, but that requires weather information about this wider area. So let's take a look at this graph, which is an instance um, not very long ago where uh, MISO had a load that was unusually high. Um, it, was a, it was a very cold winter day and the demand for electricity was pretty high. And MISO was able to meet its demand partly by importing a lot of energy, a lot more than usual from neighboring RTOs. So the peak of that green graph is, is importing about 14,000 megawatts of, of power. Our typical is maybe four or 5,000. Um, and you can see that the black line on there is the price of electricity in MISO. So other neighboring markets can see the price in MISO and often respond to them and say, well, we can make some more money by selling our power into MISO. That only works if um, those neighboring areas are not experiencing the same or as severe uh, weather phenomena as MISO is. And it works both ways. MISO may have mild weather when a neighbor has extreme weather. So as Adam has pointed out to me, um, MISO has access to the forecast from our, uh, from our neighbors so we can do some planning and prepare for these things. And we have these price signals that our neighbors can see. So generators in neighboring markets um, can decide whether to sell into our market. But this kind of sharing is really useful for day-to-day -day operations, but it's hard to incorporate into long-term planning. Uh, we need to know more about the scale of these, of these weather systems to know how much we could depend on our neighbors and avoid building generators in our own territory. You know, it's one thing to say, we have the generators that we have and the weather is bad here, but it's good somewhere else. But it's another thing to ask the question, how many generators do we need to keep around knowing or, or uncertain about how much we can lean on our neighbors? Um, so it would be nice to know this more about meteorology to know the value of this mutual aid and to justify and, and make decisions about where we should be building power lines and um, how, how much they're worth to connect and, and be able to import or export power from our neighbors. So I'm gonna end the discussion of um, operations there uh, to move on to our final presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Adam and Steve, uh, for a very interesting uh, operational perspective presentation. And now we'll go over to the policy perspective with uh, Mark Alston. Thank you, John. Uh, well, I've been asked, asked to speak on this intersection of energy policy and meteorology policy, really, here, I think. And uh, uh, my background is I was running a small company called WinLogix. It was one of the earlier companies, along with John's company and others, looking at how to improve uh, the, uh, the resource assessment, design, and operation of wind plants way back in the early 2000s. Uh, that company was acquired by NextEra Energy, uh, and uh, that technology has been incorporated into, into that giant of an energy company that's the largest developer of renewable, renewable and storage projects in the world here. Uh, and uh, my role has expanded to be broader, looking at the trends in the industry, at trends with markets, and, and pull all this together that you heard about from the, the other speakers. Uh, but I'm talking about this in a fairly technical uh, context. I'm, I'm coming from a technical background, as most of you are, and so I'll, I'll look at it in that light. Uh, next slide, please. First of all, as you've heard from the speakers here, I want to first point out how much progress has been made. I mean, if you went back 20 years from now, uh, you know, there was very little use of, of uh, the state-of-the-art meteorology in the energy sector here. We've come a long way. I mean, uh, with MISO, they actually dispatch all the wind and solar plants based on forecasts. They do, you know, this is incorporated into those operations. Uh, so system operators are using it a lot. All, you know, there's about a half dozen of the large system operators like MISO that you just heard from. All of those now have one or more uh, forecasts of, of high resolution analysis of the wind plants and the solar plants in, in their region, uh, along with many other forecast variables coming in, as you heard. So it's come a long way there. They're, they're using these forecasts very well. Similarly, on the planning and, and development of projects, as you heard uh, from Jason, uh, Justin here, 
uh, you know, a, a long, a, much advanced over what it was in terms of really incorporating true weather modeling into how we develop renewable plants. So we should, first of all, give ourselves some credit for, for the progress that has been made. There's a couple of very interesting things that are really hot right now. One is applying this to large scale transmission planning. There is finally in this country some serious discussion around a national high voltage backbone grid to tie together all of the country so that we can take better advantage of renewables. You know, so there's, this obviously is very dependent on weather input and modeling to understand all these correlations and make sense of that. And next, uh, you know, right now that the hot item is of course, uh, what's coming out of the current administration in Washington about these goals of really essentially complete grid transformation over a span of a, uh, a decade or a little bit more, which in the, in the time frame of the energy system, the grid is extremely, extremely fast. Now, I would point out that progress is actually surprisingly good over the last four years as well, but it was the states and the companies and the, the cities that are really stepping up to the plate and coming up with these, uh, these goals of getting to certain percentages of clean energy. Now we're seeing it at a national level uh, and we're, you know, our, imagine what it's really gonna take here to decarbonize, you know, to get to like 80% clean electricity by 2030 or in that time frame. That is a massive undertaking, a complete transformation of the types of technologies we have on the grid. It, we would have to scale up the, uh, the number of uh, renewable plants we build every year by a factor of three or four beyond what we've ever done before. And we have to completely transform this grid while it continues to work reliably, right? So you're literally investing on the order of one trillion with a T dollars in, in upgrading the system while it has to continue to operate reliably. That's causing us to have to really rethink a lot of our concepts that were built originally for conventional thermal-based plants. Concepts that they call like resource adequacy, you know, how are we going to use long-term storage? What about these multi-day correlated events that are, are now all you know, weather correlated? You know, so this is a huge deal. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's uh, the most exciting time I've ever seen in the, in the industry. Uh, what's, what I'm going to talk about though a bit more today is just to also impart on you how, how quickly I think this is going to evolve because I, I also think we're starting to see a move not just from the, the half dozen large RTO the system operators like myself as the customers for a lot of this and not just the developers of the conventional renewable plants but that actually there might end up with tens or even hundreds of thousands of smart actors within this space that have increasingly uh, directly monetizable motivations to actually start taking advantage of much better forecasts and probabilistic, probabilistic inputs and so forth to do all this. So I'll talk about that just a moment so you understand just how transformational I think this is. Next slide, please. This is just one example I'm gonna talk about. It's something I've been obsessing about for the last couple of years, which is what's come to be called hybrid resources. The concept looks very simple. I might have a standalone solar plant like the top part, and I might have a standalone battery storage plant like at the bottom. But increasingly we're seeing reasons why we wanna couple those together and not just connect them at the same point, but actually treat them as a single system, right? So even to uh, somebody like MISO, this wouldn't look like a separate wind plant, a separate battery plant anymore. You know, we're working through a lot of discussion about, you know, would we actually run this as a single power plant which has characteristics that are different and I would say better than any of the individual technologies that make it up. And the reason we can do that is because all of this stuff is digital, it's all software, it's all electronics. Uh, you have a lot of ability to, uh, to do analytics and to incorporate forecasts and to come up with very smart behaviors at the point where it interconnects with the rest of the grid, right? So next slide, please. If we can click forward one more here on this stage, uh, what you see is that, you know, as we've seen in other, other industries, other technologies, as soon as you start combining components together into a system and you look at how you're going to optimize that system, it completely changes things as you, as you look at optimizing the system rather than just the pieces, right? So if we're building a standalone solar PV plant, typically uh, if it's a 100 megawatt plant, we would have about 130 megawatts of PV panels that, that produce direct current. And then we would convert that to, a, to alternating current, get 100 megawatts out there. So we overbuild a little bit because not every day is perfectly sunny and so forth, but only by maybe 30%. So 
So, but now if we now create a hybrid, if you go ahead one more step, we're actually seeing optimizations work out that once we actually create a hybrid, we would probably put in about 180 megawatts of PV panels to make that same sort of 100 megawatt plant where it connects with the grid. Now, why would we do that? Because we can never inject more than 100 megawatts at any instant. So we're throwing away essentially all that clipped energy up above that dotted line, right? Well, no, we're not because uh, next step, please. You know, if you have storage there, you can capture essentially all of that. And if you go ahead another step or two, one more. Uh, what we can do then is we're actually using this as a system where we, we take that clipped energy, which could, ne could have never actually been injected to the power grid. We use the storage, we use the software electronics to shift that to other time periods to create other valuable services with it. So it ends up looking not just like the combination of the, of the technologies, but to some extent it starts to look like something very different. Next slide, please. Now that's just the start because of course, once I can do that with these pieces, why would I not continue to add other pieces, right? And it turns out it's actually, I, I think it will be quite a bit you know, easier that as we get new technologies, we'll at least, at least first try them out by adding them inside these hybrid power plants, which are really of course coming to look just like a, a virtual power plant, a software controlled device, a system, whatever you wanna call it because I could add other generation that comes along. Maybe we'll have some cleaner, even cheaper energy, but might not be as, as easy or flexible to, to directly connect to the grid. Maybe we'll get longer duration storage, but it's kind of slow and clunky. That's fine, I'll put it in here because I have all of the, the pieces I need to make it look very, very clean and nice by the time it hits the grid. I could even put hydrogen electrolyzers if I have a lot of extra clipped energy. I'll just put more cheap generation back there purely to create hydrogen and use that for various purposes, whether that's storage or for other products. And a lot of other innovation you know, that we're coming up with here. My point is that once we move to these being digital software controlled devices that can actually do a lot of sophisticated analytics behind where they connect to the grid, you know, it's going to speed up the pace of innovation to the digital pace that we're used to from the web and not just the rather slow pace we see in the power sector historically. And I can very easily reprogram, reconfigure, come up with new ideas and create new services. You know, so it's going to be a pace of innovation that's quite amazing. And this requires a lot of very specific locational probabilistic meteorology input because so many of my decisions are based on how I'm gonna combine this together what is my confidence in how much energy I will have, right? And, and how do I look at my opportunity cost? Do I use that energy now or do I use it later when it might be more valuable to create some better service for the grid? Fundamentally, what I'm saying here is we're getting to the point where if you give me enough software, electronics, energy, and storage, I can emulate any kind of electrical machine you wanna see at the point where it interconnects to the power grid. You know, so why would I not create a much more flexible, capable, more intelligent, more analytics, one that actually incorporates a lot of meteorology information within its decisions as part of its analytics? Next slide, please. So that's just one example of some of the innovation. There's more going on with transmission and other things as well. But fundamentally, as I said, you know, we're looking at an unprecedented next 10 to 15 years. We could very, very easily be investing more than $1 trillion in new equipment, upgrades, transmission, and everything to make all this work as we move toward 80% clean, even more when we move toward 100% clean electricity and we get into uh, to, you know, decarbonizing other energy vectors with that electricity. But this is massive investment. Those investments have to be hedged. We have to get good financing to do this. You know, that requires lowering the uncertainty around this. The decarbonization techniques we're going to use are almost all weather dependent renewables to produce the core electrons that we need. And then we're seeing a lot of energy limited devices, technologies like batteries, where we really have to understand both current and future forecasts in terms of when we want to deploy those. And we could very well see changing markets. You know, the mics of the market, like you heard described, we could might move to even, you know, expect the participants in that market to be smarter. They would need to incorporate this weather information to do that. So the bottom line here in the bottom is that as we get more of these third party participants, they're going to have a much higher need and a much easier way of directly converting incrementally better forecasts of meteorology information into financial results and performance results and everything else is going to be value to them. 
So the customer base for you know, improved forecasts and meteorology in general could grow dramatically. Uh, we'll also see that uh, we'll be taking advantage of that software electronics, we'll be having plasticity, so we might completely change how these things work you know, as we see the, the great evolutions going on with the grid in terms of what the grid is going to need as it makes this transition toward being you know, close to 100% clean. And I think that this evolution is going to be an exciting time both for the participants in the energy sector, but their need for forecasts will have never been greater. Now, how that translates directly into meteorology policy, uh, you know, I'll need some help and some discussion on that with others here that, uh, that are involved with us and certainly from, from you, uh, all of you on the call here today on the presentations. Uh, but I think it's a golden time for this. And uh, I look forward to it. I think it's going to be a, a great time to, to really advance energy meteorology as well. I think it's the last slide and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Mark. And I think we have a couple of questions. Jeff, you want to go ahead with those? Yeah, sure. Uh, the um, uh, Thanks panelists. It was terrific presentations and it certainly uh, initiated some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we do have a comment uh, from Arthur Reese uh, from uh, NOAA NWS Ocean Prediction Center about um, uh, it's important that NOAA and the Weather Service and wind energy companies share MET and ocean data and data rights be as open as possible. Uh, this has always been a historical problem uh, sharing data from the wind energy and uh, renewable energy industry. And he notes the uh, NOAA Orsted Agreement. Orsted is an offshore wind developer uh, with several projects along the east coast of the US. Um, so the NOAA Orsted Agreement is a great example of that. Uh, we have a first question is uh, from Bill Mahoney and this is to the panel. Uh, what are or will be the biggest weather uh, med ocean challenges for offshore wind plants. So anybody want to take a shot at that or? Well, I think that there, there are lots of challenges uh, that um, a lot, many of us are very eagerly getting ready to tackle. I think that some of the things that are particularly interesting is what makes the US East Coast different from what we see in the North Sea and the waters around Northern Europe, where they have a lot of um, advanced work already happening in another way with offshore wind. But we have variations in sea surface temperature off the East Coast that affect the evolving wind profiles. And so we have um, stronger stability conditions, more high shear types of situations that um, the offshore wind in industry might not have as much experience with. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having a lot of atmospheric scientists and oceanographers dealing with um, those ocean atmosphere interactions that may be different from what's been seen in Europe. That's just one of many examples though. Yeah, to follow up with that, I think there's a lot of unknowns right now um, with respect to offshore wind and considering how quickly we're gonna have to build it out if we're gonna meet these objectives, we need to get our arms around it really <laughs> promptly. Um, one of my concerns is for the plants that are further north, and John and I have discussed this a little bit, is I don't think we really have our arms around how large the icing impacts may be. Um, when we have severe cold air outbreaks into um, the northern Atlantic, um, the Massachusetts area, um, I really don't have a, a feel for it. And when I've talked to other people, they don't have a feel for it. And that scares me. Well, we, we could ask Orsted, they do have the deep water wind farm, uh, what used, what was uh, the deep water wind south of Block Island. Anyone else? Okay, so we could move on uh, to the next question, uh, also from Bill. Uh, what are the latest thoughts about dynamic transmission line rating based on environmental conditions? I'll, I'll start and others should chime in. I, I mean, I think we are seeing a lot of progress in that field about uh, dynamic line ratings and, and other ways of squeezing more, uh, more value out of the existing transmission lines, even before we start to think about building new ones or upgrading uh, those, those lines. Uh, I think, you know, I think a number of the different system operators have done a lot of pilots on this and are starting to use it at least selectively. I, I do think that 
the combination of both the dynamic line rating, which is kind of looking at the weather cooling of the lines essentially, and can you run them a little more intensely than you otherwise would is good. And there's also work on, uh, on state of the art of electronics about how to change the inductance of the lines to move the power where you want it to flow rather than where the, the core physics wants to take it. Uh, you know, so I think we're about to see a lot of a lot of more deployment of that than we than we have before. You know, and, and then we're also seeing a lot of support from FERC and from uh, from others at Department of Energy on on moving that out the door and using it a little bit uh, a little bit more aggressively than we have. Been a lot of research for a number of years, and of course, it's a great field to apply weather modeling. Just so people understand, the real issue with a lot of this on these thermal ratings is that you know lines heat up when you run a lot of power through them. And if they get too hot, they sag down where they can hit trees and, and create problems or other create other failures that could you know, cause damage or, or uh, cause faults on the line. And you don't want to do that. But yet, you, know, you don't want to run them assuming the worst case all the time because they could handle more power at least some of the hours of the day. And those could be very valuable to reduce the curtailment from renewables and get more of that power to market. So progress is good. I think we're on the verge of seeing a lot more use of it. Anybody else on the panel want to um, add some comments to that or have any response to that? Not, um, we do have a couple of questions John and I have, have thought of. Um, and, uh, and this has been touched upon in terms of, of goals uh, by everybody on the panel in one way and the question is, uh, should the ultimate goal in this new energy economy uh, be firm generation, given 100% generation from renewables, perhaps with a small amount of conventional backup? That would that require significant, and that would require significant significant amount of overbuilding given the capacity factors. So, should that be an ultimate goal? Well, that's we could talk for a couple hours on that one easily. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting because cer certainly renewables, especially like solar, the trend there is, is it's becoming so cheap that as you saw in my example with a hybrid, we're increasingly going to be willing to overbuild it. Uh, but you still have a timing issue across the day, which is why now we're seeing a lot of the move, move very rapidly from this what I call a naked solar plant to a hybrid that has you know solar plus storage, right? And in fact, for you know a number of the developers like Nextair and others, you know we're starting to call this kind of a almost firm renewable product, right? It's more of a direct replacement for like a natural gas plant, because you can shift the energy where you want and provide reserves with it and and do a lot of things that you wouldn't typically do with renewables alone, right? Uh, because they're cheap electrons. You hate to waste cheap electrons. You'd rather capture them and ship them around, do something useful with them. Mm -hmm. But there's also this, this uh, a lot of modeling going on now about we still have those multi-day events like we saw recently in California and Texas, right? Uh, where if, if the renewable output is just gonna be really bad because of the weather for a few days, then do you need some longer term storage or some, some hydrogen that you store and then burn through a gas turbine or uh, some way of, matching load for those days in between, even if it's just a couple of days out of the year, right? You still have to do that to keep a reliable grid. So that kind of, you know, and also keep nuclear plants around as being, you know, how do we do that? All the, those sort of things. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting all because a few years ago, a number of us would have said it would be always, it would be stupid to combine storage with a renewable plant because the grid is so good at providing those flexibility services, you know, why not just keep everything sim simple and separate? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're finding ways where I think both the system operator and the resource can provide help in that context. I don't think that you have to go all the way and say that, you know, every generator has to be firm every hour out of the year because none of the conventional plants ever work that way either. They have forced outages all the time. You know, so we think of them as being base load or firm and in fact, there's large reserves that the system operator keeps around because they are not always there. You know, so we're already used to dealing, you know, making a highly reliable grid from this mix of semi-reliable parts, right? Uh, we're just debating now, how do we do that with clean electrons rather than thermal electrons? 
And we're coming up with a lot of ways to do that, both through overbuilding and through going beyond just standalone wind and solar into the next steps. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback a little bit on Mark here because I think his slide really hammered home the point I was trying to make and I kind of was rushing at the end, which is that ultimately getting through these periods of low renewable resource, that's, that's the big picture here. And the point I was trying to make in, in my presentation, aside from providing the overview of what we're doing now, is how little meteorology is informing the bigger picture of the generation and transmission build out. And that's where it's absolutely crucial because there are going to be periods, and I've just completed a study with NREL where we've shown this, there will be periods where there is no wind for days and loads are high. And when I say no wind, I don't mean absolutely none, but I mean nowhere near enough to be able to get through. And this kind of hybrid idea of being able to soak up the cheap electrons and give them back some time when at, at other points, or be able to move those electrons around with a, a really um, robust um, grid. That, that's, that's the key. And uh, we are not applying the meteorological knowledge that is needed in the big picture view here. I mean, we're down in the silos again. I'm even seeing it in some of the questions. No offense meant to any of the questioners. We've got to get out of these silos and look big picture at what the real problem is here as we transition to 100% renewables. And, and I want to follow up and, and say that um, talking about firm generation sort of makes the traditional assumption that all the demand for electricity has to be satisfied no matter what. I mean, that, that is what the electricity industry is built on. And it's, it's kind of limiting. And we now, there, there have always been demand response resources. Sometimes it's controllable water heaters. Sometimes it's aluminum smelters in the Pacific Northwest shutting down when electricity is expensive in California. Um, but the technology is, is coming around like Nest thermostats that, that you now can effectively and cost effectively control a whole bunch of air conditioners. Um, it, it doesn't help with, with the multi-day events when there's no wind and a high demand, um, but it certainly helps in those kind of marginal conditions where you're close to having enough generation, but not quite. Um, but meteorology plays a really big role because the amount of um, load shedding you can get from my air conditioner depends on how hot it is at my house. And that changes. It may be different today than it is tomorrow. And when you aggregate a whole bunch of those, um, you need to understand the weather uh, to, to bid into the market as a demand response. And actually, Steve, I, I, thanks for bringing that up because I, I think that flexible loads is absolutely key to this transition and part of the paradigm shift when I said you can't shoehorn renewables into the existing system. We have this view, not just in the US, but ac across the world, that electricity is that has the same marginal cost regardless of when and where we use it. And it's just not true. You you pay extra for gas when the for gasoline when there's you know when there's a supply constraint. Um, I'm not suggesting that um, the poor people of um, of Texas, for example, should not be running their heaters during an extreme cold wave. Um, I don't think we should be passing it on that way, but we should be making um, the user understand that electricity is a commodity that uh, is, is, is very variable in price according to the supply and demand constraints. Um, instead of thinking that it's a right to run my air conditioner um, flat out, every minute of the day. Um, it is a right, but it's a right you should have to pay for. Okay. My personal opinion. Okay, our next question is, uh, is from Joel Klein of the Weather Service. Um, what are the most important improvements? Whoops, I'm sorry, that's another question. I'm, I'm good, I, I'm sorry. What do the panelists see as the top one to three areas where meteorology from the federal government weather service can aid the wind solar industry to meet its goals? on land or offshore? And how can the Weather Service get more data into models from these private companies and thus improve the models to aid these goals? Uh, 
this tough question because we don't have a representative <laughs> from the packet I'll, I'll, I'll talk briefly about one of the challenges we're facing upcoming and it, it requires a, a lot, quite a bit of data and that's distributed energy resources. So rooftop yeah. solar and other things of the sort. Forecasting that, at least in the near term, is going to be quite difficult. Um, and so, you know, more high resolution forecasts and and better data to uh, to predict that type of uh, uh, intermittent energy will be will be quite useful uh, going uh, going forward. So that's that's an area of focus we're we're, we're looking at and uh, and trying to and trying to wrap our uh, wrap our heads around. I mean, I I think in general, what I see is a move toward uh, much more need for both point specific, locational specific forecasts and the probabilistic forecast. How certain are you about these forecast variables, right? Because because uh, even like we're adding storage to uh, renewables and you may think, well, that's just going to suck up the variability. Yeah, we care less about the minute to minute variability because we have some storage there. And that's a good thing because the, the models, you know, in general, don't really tell us a whole lot about minute to minute variability. But it really increases the need for uh, for understanding how much energy is going to happen over the different time periods and how much will happen now versus later, right? So I think adding storage to the system and to these hybrids is actually the best thing we've ever seen in, in terms of increasing the value of forecast. If I'm a hybrid and I'm trying to make an offer to the system, okay, I got so much energy in my battery and I've got a PV forecast well, how confident I am in that PV forecast is everything about how much I can offer to the grid and how certain I am. Because if I offer to the market and it's cleared, I'm responsible to deliver that at least 98% of the time, or I'm going to be, you know, incur a big penalty, right? So certainty around energy for each hybrid, and I think also for the system operator, certainly around the energy from the renewables completely changes your strategy and how you're gonna use your storage. Because we only have like four hours of storage, right? You know, so uh, I think this combination actually dramatically increases the value, but it really increases the attention on, on the confidence intervals and uh, at both the, at both of the, you know, the region wide and at the, uh, the project specific basis. And, and again, thinking big picture related to what Mark's saying, but, but on the other side, the planning side, and thank you, Steve, for your comment about you can't forecast your way out of variability because you can't. And I know I've said it over and over again. Um, you know, one of the things where I think the government can really help is having large um, coincident data sets of, um, that are consistent of wind, solar, and um, well, of, of the things that impact wind, solar, load, and hydro, um, in order to do proper planning of the transmission system and the generation system, that is absolutely critical, and it's not going to happen on a private sector and, basis. The, and the other thing to Joel's question, uh, the, the other there's a huge need for looking at these multi-day correlated type situations across large regions of the country. I mean, look at what happened in Texas, guys, right? The load forecast, because of the weather inputs to it, was off by a ton, right? Not just a little bit, by tens of megawatts, which is huge. And then the temperature forecast incursion into the wind area, you know, the ice never melted off of the blades as had been predicted, right? You know, so these are rare events, but when these are these big regional events are going to get a lot of attention from NERC and from FERC and the planners and how we actually deal with this whole grid transformation. You know, this is another big area is uh, is those broad those broad meso forecast regions. Okay, I'm going to throw this over to John now for some uh, closing remarks. We just thank the panel. I'll let John do that as well. well thank you, Jeff. And uh, unfortunately, we're at the end of the session now. Very interesting uh, presentations and uh, discussion. Uh, I'm sure we can go on for a while. But a big thank you to the panelists for presenting their thought provoking perspectives on the future evolution of our electric systems. And thank you also to all of the AMS volunteers and AMS meeting staff and technical support staff that have made this session and this event uh, possible. So a big uh, appreciation, note of appreciation to them. And finally, thank you to everyone who attended and participated in this session. So now I will throw it back to you, Jennifer.
Hey, John. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. What a great uh, panel that we just had. And I'm so appreciative to you and to Jeff for moderating great questions coming in. And uh, I'm ready to move over to the final uh, part of the day. So thank you again, John and Jeff. I'd like to announce Danielle Nagel and Eli Jacks. We're not gonna take a break. We're gonna go right into a special announcement on the hazard simplification update. And Josh, I think if you've got the slides ready to go, we'll go ahead and get it up. And just excited that we have the opportunity to provide uh, an update to this community. I know that many of you have been following along with the Weather Service Hazard Simplification effort. Uh, it has been an effort to bring in a number of uh, social science findings and research that have been done over the years to try to take a look at how we can simplify our watches, warning, and advisory. So I see, uh, I believe I see Eli and Danielle. I'm gonna go ahead and take my video off and Eli, over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Jen, and appreciate the time on the agenda today. Uh, and I am Eli Jacks, uh, Chief of the Forecast Services Division here at National Weather Service Headquarters in Silver Spring. And uh, with me is our Senior Project Advisor and Social Scientist, Dr. Danielle Nagel. Uh, in our presentation, we're going to be reviewing the upcoming major change to our watch warning and advisory system that we publicly uh, announced last month. So we're now in full partner engagement mode on some of the details around this change. Uh, so we also intend for this short session to serve as an advertisement for the partners webinars we're going to be holding starting next week, and we'll have more about that later. So next slide, please. Uh, our plan for this session first is to review the feedback from the years of social science-based engagements we've conducted, and it was this feedback that led to our decision to simplify the uh, Watch Warning Advisory or WAWA system. We'll then describe the change, which is to replace advisories and special weather statements with plain language headlines. And there are a number of challenges associated with this change. Perhaps the most important among these is to ensure that our plain language messages are received as intended, or in other words, that they capture the level of intention and inspire appropriate action uh, as we intend at the advisory level. We'll then review the plan for community engagement and decision-making this year. So uh, get, let's get right to the social science research that led to this decision to change. And uh, next slide and over to Danielle. Thanks, Eli. So most of you on the call here can recite the Wawa system definitions in your sleep, I'm sure. But let me just make a couple points about the slide just to set the, st set the stage for the um, results I'll go over. So if you include special statements, also called SBSs, we actually issue four main headlines. Each of these headlines can be varying levels of severity and certainty, which can get kind of confusing, especially if you're not living and breathing the material each day. So you'll see here in the SPS definition down at the bottom that we qualified it with the word often because we know our far forecasters um, tend to use SPSs for other purposes as well, like sub watch events and to just convey general information. Next slide, please. So what did social science tell us about our decades old Wawa system? First off, there are too many products. So you can see that image on the, on the right there of a Wawa map with quite a few products on it. And we're already addressing this through consolidation. And in fact, we're looking forward to the upcoming flood product consolidation this fall. Now, we also heard there are too many headline types like the four I just mentioned during the last slide. These terms can be confusing to the public and even some partners. So specifically, we heard that while there is some confusion between the similar sounding watch warning, the most problematic term by far is advisory. Not only was the meaning misunderstood, but often it was also conflated with watch. Another key input came from our emergency managers who told us that their focus is to either prepare or act for significant events. They do care about the other information like advisory level events, but they prefer that information coming in a more plain language, clear form. So this feedback's retaining our watch and warning headlines and increasing public education on the terms though, while finding a less confusing way to convey, convey the information at the sub watch and sub warning levels. Next slide, please. So based on all this feedback and after testing multiple wording alternatives to replace watch and or advisory, 
we arrived at this final approach here. So the new system will retain all watch morning headlines as they are today, but will eliminate the Wawa based advisories and the SBS in favor of plain language headlines. So as noted, the only change to our warnings is the current small craft and tsunami advisories will be elevated to the warning level, and this will be to properly, properly account for the threat to life and property that they represent. Given the need for partner tracking and ingestion of our plain language information, the new headlines will also be equipped with VTEC. So this means that for our current advisories, the .Y significance code will be replaced with .S. So SPS will be equipped with VTEC for the first time using the same .S code. And this change was particularly popular for the partners based on uh, what we heard last year during our feedback gathering. So due to the time needed to make software changes both within Weather Service and among our partners, and then also the need to update our policy dissemination protocols and to provide partner and education considerations, these changes won't take take place prior to 2024. Okay, back to you, Eli. Um, more details on this change coming up, and you can go on to the next slide. Thanks a lot, Danielle. So this next slide displays two sample before and after messages with the changes highlighted in yellow. So at the top left is a current winter weather advisory that transitions to a plain language headline. You'll see that the dot Y significance code uh, in VTEC changes to dot S, as Dan Daniel mentioned, and this change would avoid any possibility that the advisory term would appear in our dissemination systems once the change is made. Note also that there's a change from the advisory headline to plain language. The exact language shown here is actually from our initial surveys. We've already learned that using words such as light and moderate can be problematic because these terms can mean different things to different people and across different regions of the country. We also heard we should not use amounts such as two to four inches of snow in our headlines, as doing so may conflict with partner information. Now in the bottom tier of the slide, you'll see how we would transition our current SPSs to plain language. You can see the addition of VTEC with the .S significance code again, and the conversion of the message from free form to a what, where, when, and impacts format. Next slide, please. So armed with this feedback, we, we have created a number of initial options for plain language headlines. We collected comments from our forecasters on these options via four webinars we held over the past few weeks, and we'll be, we'll be discussing these same options with uh, our partners at the upcoming webinars. What you see here are just examples to start the conversation, and we've also provided some ideas on how each option could play out in red text. The first option is just to state the hazard, possibly followed by a colon, and then add language to further describe the hazard and its impact. So examples could include snow, some, some accumulation expected today, or snow, slippery roads today. Next, we could leave the message with caution, followed by a description and or impact phrase. And again, in red text, you see an example of how this could look. Now we selected caution as a specific option because the actual definition of advisory in our policy is that as long as caution is exercised, the event at this level is not a direct threat to life and property. A third option could feature another highlighting word other than caution, such as be aware, which has been used in the UK as part of their media alarm system. And for this option, we could consider other leading terms such as alert, attention, or notice. These are all words we've considered over the past year. However, I would point out the thin line we'd be walking with any of these leading terms um, is that we'd risk introducing a new third noun headline to the system, which could potentially be confused with the other two. And this would run counter to what we're trying to accomplish with plain language and stream, streamlining the system. Option four is to just use plain text without any embellishment at all. The question with this option is whether we can capture the level of attention intended. We know from last year's feedback that broadcasters in particular are concerned about the issue of not having a leading term or a noun of some sort at the advisory level, but there may be other ways to overcome this issue using, for example, selective use of capitalization or some other amplifying means of communicating the message. Again, part of the motivation here is to align with the prepare and act mode that emergency managers use enable copying and pasting of, of clear plain language for those they serve, 
and re remove the existing confusion among the three headline terms that clearly exists in the public domain. But again, we've heard uh, clearly that the advisory level is still important. So we also need to honor that finding. As part of that, it bears repeating that for any of the options shown here, the VTEC code within the plain language statements will still enable automated cap capabilities such as map coloring and customized phone alerting to continue as is the case with advisory today. We are looking forward to receiving partner and public feedback on these options uh, as we move forward. So now let me go back to Danielle for a second for a few quick case studies or examples of how our internal graphics would align with this change and how partner graphics could be designed as well. So next slide, please, and Danielle, uh, uh, it's all yours. Okay, so we've already shown you how the side-by-side -side text products would appear, but now we just wanted to demonstrate some ideas of how local and national products could look through graphics. So we really wanna stress up front that this is not a goal of our new system to de-emphasize the importance of graphics in any way. In fact, plain language should, should be easily transferable to any technology. And it's really intended to increase the clarity and flexibility within graphics. So what I'll show you on these next few slides are just really notional images for discussion. Here on slide eight, it's an example of how we could change graphics that have included the mention of an advisory headline. And so we're here we're using plain language instead of a Wawa term. Note that the graphic highlights windy today, circled in green there, instead of wind advisory. And this eliminates any confusion that it might be windy by those who have confused watch and advisory in the past. Next slide, please. So slide nine here shows just another example, this time for frost advisory. You'll see the headline at the top of the graphic and the pop-up text there showing a plain language description of the hazard instead. And next slide, please. Finally, um, slide 10 shows how media, a media partner graphic might convey multiple Wawa's where one is currently in an advisory. So we've made this really generic on purpose, um, trying to stay away from the current Wawa map colors, just to make the point that such graphics could be created by really any partner. The language used in the right side legend here is just our suggestion. As a note, we did test the use of colors within headlines. So while red warning for snow, for instance, didn't really garner positive feedback, Parks did emphasize to us that color could be used as a, as a supplement, so in a supplementary fashion. So I show this as an example of how a partner could use a traffic light type of approach to convey the diff different levels of severity in this case. And next slide, and back to you, Eli. Okay, thanks, Danielle. And we're ready to just about ready to open it up for questions. But first, uh, just here's our calendar for the rest of 2021. Uh, we just completed our internal webinars with our forecasters last, last week. Uh, week. And we're now analyzing the feedback we received from them. Meanwhile, we've now announced a series of partner webinars we've scheduled next week, and we're welcoming all of you to join. Uh, registrate, registration links for uh, each of these webinars are posted on our website or just email us uh, with a request for more information. I'll provide you with the website URL and email address on the next slide as we take questions. Uh, and as with the forecast of webinars, the feedback from the partners webinars will drive the final options we provide be a public survey this summer, so you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback uh, via that vehicle as well. And so um, the analysis of that is going to uh, lead to a decision on, on the uh, approach or approaches that we take moving forward. So that's what we have uh, for the introduction. We're going to be talking much more on the partner webinars. And if you can go to the next slide, um, uh, here's our URL and, and our email address. Uh, so we'll leave that up and you, uh, we welcome you to uh, uh, register for these webinars. And uh, Jen, we're happy to take any questions at this point. Great. First and foremost, are you willing to share this deck post form, the slide deck? Certainly. I mean, we're going to be, uh, uh, this is all going to be what we're going to be basing our feedback on. So that's a good thing. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to read the, the questions. I've got a question that's come in. So folks, don't be shy. If you have questions, please put it in the chat. Do uh, note it for attendees, so it's not just the panelists. You can do a drop down for panelists and attendees. Uh, Paul Hepner from GST, was it discussed that six inches of snow that constitutes a winter storm warning is not the same threat to life and property as a tornado warning or hurricane warning would be? 
Six inches of snow might be a high impact disruptive, but not the same threat as a tornado or severe thunderstorm. Um, thanks for the question. We, we didn't actually discuss that. Of course, they're, they're completely different um, hazards. Um, uh, there are uh, many uh, traffic fatalities uh, in less than six inches of snow. In fact, one, one of the things we've, we found is that people are more apt to drive at the advisory level than they would during a winter storm warning. So uh, uh, it, there is a huge threat to life and property for winter storms, just as they're much, uh, I mean, I'm not going to downplay the, the, uh, the threat from tornadoes and severe thunderstorms, but um, uh, there, there are, unfortunately, plenty of uh, fatalities uh, across all hazards. And uh, of course, the most fatalities we uh, experience is with heat, which is the silent killer uh, more than any, any other hazard. Great, thank you. I am not seeing actually any other questions coming in. I will wait another minute or two. Uh, Jordan Girth, did you examine combining many of the advisories into a traveler's advisory for snow, fog, ice, et cetera? Well, uh, that, that uh, dials us way, way back. Uh, we used to have a traveler's advisory uh, in, the, in the weather service, and I'm not completely familiar with why that, that went away. But again, with the plain language, what we're trying to do is to get away from the noun phrase. We're trying to just describe the, the impact and the hazard uh, so, so that um, uh, folks can take appropriate action. Great, okay. Any last minute calls? I know you guys are tired. I know it's 5.01, but oh, wait, I think we've got one from uh, Brian Golding, which by the way, it's, it's so nice to see you on here, Professor Golding. Um, you mentioned heat and maybe air quality is similar. How do you see this revamp playing out in that sort of warning? Ah, this is Danielle's specialty. Are you still there, Danielle? Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, so I mean, for our, so start out easy, for our heat advisory, um, that's slated to go to plain language. Um, so just like the proposal that you saw here, or sorry, the, the decision that you saw here would, would apply for heat advisory, um, just the same. Um, air quality is a little more complicated because um, we issue air quality alerts as pass-throughs. So we um, get those from our air quality forecaster partners and um, pass those through our systems. Um, also, air quality alert is an alert, not an advisory. Um, so we're not we're not uh, dealing with that term in and of itself through through this change. Um, but the the Weather Service Public Program is looking into how to better convey air quality alerts and how to better collaborate with our air quality partners um, around the messaging and the clarity of the the words and the language. So um, that's a bit of a separate effort from HASSIMP, but it's out there. Um, as for heat. Besides the advisory change, um, we have an upcoming change um, happening next year or potentially the year after, um, changing excessive heat watch and warning to extreme heat watch and warning to better align um, with the uh, extreme cold products. So that's that's one change coming as well. And the, again, the public program is working on um, really just a, a revamping and um, reinvigorating our heat program in general. So more, more to come on that as well. Great, thank you, Dr. Nagel. Uh, one question coming in from uh, Dr. Rick Rosen. Can you say something more about your plans to survey the public? What sort of outreach are you thinking about? Who and how widespread? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rosen, for the question. We uh, actually, uh, during our phase of surveying last year, um, uh, through our warning coordination meteorologists and through a uh, very cleverly designed QR code that was put on our, uh, our outreach sheet, uh, we're able to get um, some uh, 80,000 responses to the survey questions. And we're looking for something like that again. So we, we really rely on our warning coordination meteorologists to spread the word because they each, from their forecast offices, have dozens, if not hundreds of partners in some cases, that they can amplify uh, the message to and then our, our um, public affairs office has, has lists. We have our Weather Ready Nation ambassadors. So um, I'm confident we'll, we'll get a very uh, good response to this that we can analyze the results from. Great, thank you, Eli. All right, any last takers? I know you're tired. I know you're ready. Let's see. 
If I get anyone pop in, otherwise I'll close this out. Jen, I think we have a commie comment from Louis. Oh Louis. yes, I see one <laughs> from our esteemed Dr. Louis Uccellini. Thank you, Louis. Urban heat prediction focused on specific areas is also part of the social equity challenges being looked at in our service program. So it's not a question so much as just a highlight uh, and an important highlight for us. Any comments on that? Well, well, absolutely, uh, uh, especially here in, in the uh, local area. Uh, and thank you, Louis, for the comment. The, the, uh, uh, the Baltimore, Washington area um, uh, notes uh, excessive uh, heat deaths in the urban corridor. And so this is um, uh, an issue that's, that is linked to social equity and that we need to continue to study further. Yeah, it's been a theme that's been throughout this uh, these three days. Okay, it's 5.05. And I'm going to let you guys go early. So, because uh, you know, it's been a long, long day. But I just want to thank our keynote speakers, Dr. Janae Carlos, Dr. Amanda Lynch, as well as our wonderful panelists and moderators for the sessions on making weather, water, and climate programs happen and the energy policy and science in the next decade. It's, it was really an energizing day, good topics, different topics. Thank you, Eli and Dr. Nagel, for the important update on the hazard simplification. Thank you for sharing, being willing to share your slides. And uh, I let you go before I will see you tomorrow at the final day, almost there of the 2021 AMS Washington Forum. And it's still a beautiful day in my neighborhood. It's just a hot day apparently outside. So I'm gonna get out and enjoy a little bit of time, but you guys have a wonderful evening and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 12 p.m. Thank you again so much. Take care. <laughs>